What does Lethal Company hide off camera from the player on the moon map experimentation? Lethal Company is a quite comedic multiplayer horror roguelite where you and some friends must fly to various abandoned moons to collect junk while working for a questionable company. Today, we will take a look at some stuff we're not typically supposed to see on this moon, like this strange Google Maps photo used for the skybox, and even some out-of-bounds content. We'll be breaking some things along the way as usual, and we'll even visit good old Jeb to finish our drop-off. So I hope you enjoy today's look behind the scenes of Lethal Company. So in this video, we're obviously going to be breaking this game quite a bit. But while that's all fun and good, one thing you don't want to break in is in your security and privacy. And thankfully NordVPN, the sponsor of today's video, has you covered. NordVPN offers you the privacy you need in the world today by encrypting your data and making your connection appear like it's coming from somewhere else. Just open the map, click a location, and now you're connected and protected. It's that simple. And this masked connection keeps your data safe from prying eyes. This will guard you against common cybersecurity threats like DDoS attacks, or man-the-middle schemes where a fake public Wi-Fi tries to leech your data. Another big perk outside of protection is being able to access region locked shows and movies. Different streaming content is offered based on location. So whether you're traveling or want to watch programming from another country, with NordVPN, you have the freedom to hop around easily and access it. So bump up your security and expand your entertainment by going to nordvpn.com slash horoscoped to get four months extra on a two year plan. There's a 30 day money back guarantee as well. And a big thanks to NordVPN for supporting me as a creator. As per usual, I typically hit you guys with a very brief summary, so we are all on the same page with what I'm covering. So Experimentation is one of the very first moons you can access in Lethal Company. It's one of the easier levels, and if you start up your ship right as the game loads on a new profile, you'll find yourself flying there. Now, Lethal Company is a co-op game, so as soon as you land, you and your, uh, friends? Which is debatable. Run out of the ship and try to enter the facility. Experimentation is a rocky and barren place. Its info reads as follows. Conditions, arid, low habitability, worsened by industrial artifacts. History, not discovered for quite some time due to its close orbit around gas giant Big Grin. However, it appears to have been used in secret, so getting to the interior of the stage won't take long. While here, you can run into roaming locusts, spore lizards, manta coils, hygroderis, hoarding bugs, snare fleas, those big old worms, and occasionally eyeless dogs. One of your players can stay up top in the ship as they view the map and assist you from above, while the others brave the unknown and try to retrieve scrap without dying. As the day progresses, things become more dangerous as more entities spawn. So hurry back to the ship before it takes off and leaves you behind. You then take your scrap over to Jeb at the company and head out for another awful day on the job. So let's begin with the ship as soon as you start the game. So if you look outside the ship, we can see two giant black spheres with a sea of red covering the surrounding area. Although this red is just a currently visible game region that is normally invisible to the player, it does give me some Iron Lung vibes. When we select our destination and proceed, you'll see our ship does a quick jump and then proceeds to land as the world around us loads in. So I'm just going to get rid of some of the fog we normally experience here, so now we can get an overall better look at the level. The daylight is definitely our friend when it comes to visibility throughout this adventure. The map itself goes out pretty far though, as you can see this landscape kind of goes on forever. It wasn't long until I saw something surprising though once I went under the terrain. Just take a look at the skybox. It's basically a picture straight out of the Google Maps Street View, and I couldn't help but laugh when seeing this. I mean, it makes sense since the in-game camera has so many post-processing effects and filters applied that you never really know what it fully looked like. But following this, you'll see that there's a big structure beneath us. We'll get back to that in a few moments though, because I decided to go further out and explore. Only to discover this. It's a player model floating above this square platform. You can see that the blue map dot is attached to this model as well. This is something the player will normally see if they are the one left in charge of watching the map back on the ship, with the map dot representing that particular player. So this out of bounds area is actually where the game stores the multiplayer characters depending on how many people are in your party. If we take a closer look, we'll see this character is actually three player models stacked on top of each other. And this is because currently I'm in a solo game and no other players are present. Anyways, I decide to continue venturing out, but realize I'm very prone to getting lost out here, given it all looks the same. So I quickly change my mind and head back. As you can see, this building is fairly large and vacant. Peeking into all these buildings shows unfinished interiors, which makes sense in the grand scheme of it all. Because normally, when the player enters the main entrance, it appears as if we went into the building itself, when really, we're being teleported. Teleported where? Well, 
way down under this part of the map. The interior of the building is located way beneath the ground, not relative to the surface we are led to believe. You can see the entrance up here leads nowhere when we take the camera back behind the entrance door. I found this to be cool, because if we view it from above, it's as if we're looking at the map we're provided with in our ship. Just like the map, we can see all the icons that indicate where particular items and doors are located. The green ones are open doors, and red ones are closed doors. If a player that's exploring comes across a red labeled door, they can have a teammate who is on the ship open said door by typing the door's ID into the terminal on the ship. All these colored icons for the radar map are tied to each 3D model down below in its prefab package, but they're only visible through certain cameras in-game. On another note, just like the map on the ship, all the scrap that we're able to scavenge is marked with yellow triangles as well. It's kind of neat to see this stuff in a 3D radar view. Another thing that seasoned players are probably aware of is that this dungeon map generates differently when starting at the level, hence why a seed number appears on screen. Like a roguelike, the interior is randomly generated, which keeps the exploration fresh and traversing these halls a bit more challenging. Anyways, before heading back to the surface, we'll be able to see in between the surface and underground interior that there are various objects scattered all about. My guess is that these are potentially just leftover assets, but amongst them all, there are also two T-posed player models. Going back up though, I went and gave the sun a little look-see, and it appears flat and is only visible from the side we normally see it from. The sun does move throughout the day, and most players will know that daylight is precious and doesn't stick around as long as one would like. Moving on, we're now going to show all the monsters and entities I came across during my endeavors in this level. Before getting started though, let's take a look at our player model. Our player, of course, has a map dot attached to it, but we can easily remove this. You also notice we have, um, four arms. So the floating arms you see are actually part of a scavenger model for the first person camera view, whereas the arms attached to the body are a part of the player's multiplayer model. The scavenger model arms are only visible to that player themselves, like when you go to pick up objects, etc. I decided I'm not going to remove them though, because four hands are better than two. And because it's silly looking. Starting outside, we have these real aggressive bees that you'll find lingering by a ball-shaped hive. This hive can be scavenged, but also comes with the risk of being stung to death. So I grabbed the nest and played around for a little bit with these little guys as they attempted to kill me. This interaction is slowed down because they can kill you fairly quickly, but I do eventually take a fatal blow. No honey for this guy. If you didn't notice already, when all players die, or if time runs out, the starship will depart. You'll notice in this view a lot of these reddish walls, and even this white structure the ship is clipping through. The reddish walls are environmental triggers for particular actions, sometimes for audio like the wind, and others, like below the map, trigger respawns if the player falls into them, with the white structure being a nav mesh for the ship. Anyways, there are also peaceful creatures, such as this double-winged bird, as it's called in the scene files, also known as manta coils. They just fly around and mind their own business. So at this point, I decided to stay outside and wait to see what the game throws at me. It wasn't too long until it got dark that I encountered these mouth dogs as they are labeled. They will unearth from the ground as you can see, and then just patrol around the area of the starship. Like most enemies in the game, getting too close to these creatures will get their attention. I dance around a bit with this one, but then it pulls a fast one on me and one-shots me as it's looking away from me. I basically teleport into its mouth and became its dinner. Well, never mind. Joke's on me. Apparently, I don't taste good. The last hostile creature I encountered outside was, well, a much bigger monster. Normally when it's late and you're going back and forth with your loot, you'll encounter these giant sandworms. The trick with these guys is that you want to be constantly moving. Going underground, we can get a better look at these monsters and it's pretty funny looking. They patrol the outside area in a similar manner as the eyeless dogs, just underground. These creatures are quite big and instantly remind me of the Tremors movies. You'll see these red map dots are the worms and my goal is now to get eaten by one. At first I thought the game was broken as nothing was happening, but then I could see something taking place. Sure enough, the sandworm comes barreling out of the ground as it literally deletes me. My player body was no more. These things will soar high into the sky when they perform their attacks, making for quite the spectacle. Of course, this is slowed down, but as you can see, it will plummet back towards the surface and into the ground. I found it underground in a J-shaped pose as I continued to try and find my body. Safe to say my player won't be in lethal company too. On that note, it's now time to go under and make some friends with the creatures lurking in these halls beneath the surface of experimentation. Making my way into the building, my first encounter is with a centipede, as it's called on the map, also known as the snare flea. Once in its range, it will drop down from the ceiling and chase you. Its attack involves wrapping itself around the player and doing continuous damage. If the player is at full health, they can survive this initial attack though. 
The centipede will retreat and find another spot to hang from again. At this point, it will kill you if you engage it again. And I gotta say, it's pretty hilarious to see. The struggle is real. I figured while we're here, I decided to make our little friend, well, not so little. And oh my god, what have I done? It is now completely constricting the entire body of the player. And what a sight it is. Luckily, its damage is the same, and we will survive this ordeal. As it lets go, a horde bug shows up to say hi, but the centipede soon after repeats its actions, finding a place to hide on the ceiling. This time it's a little more, well, terrifying if you ask me. Its body clips to the ceiling, and only its head is visible to the player. This doesn't look too comfy. Let's go find the hoarder bug though. Now, normally, the hoarder bug is peaceful. This guy likes to pick up loot and run away with it, hoarding the item, so to speak. However, if the player attempts to take loot from the bug, well, it doesn't like it and proceeds to kill you. With no loot around, this guy seems pretty chill and just wants to hang out. So I decided to give him a power-up mushroom as well, and yeah. Imagine actually running into this buffed up guy in game. Looks like all their work in the gym has paid off, but the same can't be said for me, as they destroy my puny player. My next encounter involved a creature that is listed as Puffer Enemy, or as it's commonly known, Spore Lizard. Unlike the other enemies, this creature avoids confrontation and will retreat from the player. It appears to be a lizard with a large mouth and a big purple ball on the end of its tail. I had minimal encounters with this creature, but it's a good tip to know that if you do pursue this creature and corner it, it will become hostile. So it's best to leave this strange guy be and do the exact opposite of what we're doing here. Heading back in after my fateful encounter with the puffer enemy, I come across an arachnid enemy. The sand spider, as it's called in the files, will spew out webs as it roams the halls. It's commonly known by players as the bunker spider. It hides in a similar manner as the centipede and will wait for the player to make contact with its webs, making for a nail-biting experience. As you can see, walking over this portion of the web will alert the bunker spider and it will continuously pursue you. It hits hard and can kill you fairly quickly. The best part about the spider killing the player, though, is what it does with the player after the fact. Like Frodo Baggins from Lord of the Rings, it wraps the player up into a webbed cocoon. Then it'll string the player up and just leave their dangling corpse behind. I knew I didn't have much time to view this, as the game was ending because my player had died. So when this happened, the game unloaded everything, leaving the player to fall into a dark abyss. What a way to go! At this point, I decided to give the spider steroids as well, and my gosh, mistakes were made. As you can see, it's clipping through the structure, and this turned into a big nope zone real quick. I initiate a chase with it, and it's as panic-inducing as it looks. I need a new suit. The last time I encountered in this dungeon was the green slime. This is no flubber, if I'm gonna be honest, but this blob, as it's internally called, moves fairly slow. This is commonly known as the hygro deer. But don't let it fool you. Once it sees you, it will slowly but surely pursue you. It only takes a few hits before it kills our player, making it dangerous. I went ahead and made this creature bigger too, realizing that this would be pretty difficult to actually play in normal gameplay. I'm giving myself bad ideas because this would be one heck of a challenge, that's for sure. Sadly, I tried bringing these creatures up to the surface and outside and was met with negative results. It seems they are bound to the container region that holds the randomly generated interior and moving them beyond it puts them back inside. However, the whole time I've been beefing up these creatures, I didn't think once of doing the same for my player. So I went outside and did just that. The best part about this is that the size doesn't affect my player's jumping or speed. So it makes for a hilarious scene as this giant Ant-Man suit nearly runs in place out here. I know there are other entities down here in this interior, but I didn't have much luck with encountering any more of them. So now we're gonna go back to the ship and head to the company building. The company building is where players are supposed to take all the loot they have gathered and sell it. There's not much to explore here in normal gameplay, but you can see here that the building is huge. Something else to note, just like in the level experimentation, is that this level also has the extra player models sitting way off in the distance. It's reasonable to say that this is going to be in every level. Coming back to the accessible area though, you'll see this window where the players can drop the items they collected. If you ring the bell and step away, all the items will be pulled in and sold. The catch here is if you linger too close while this happens, these tentacles will fly out and grab you, killing you in the process. This alien is known as Jeb, and looking at a bounds shows it's a floating tentacle, just waiting for its next meal apparently. Alongside it is a big hook that will grab the items you want to sell. So hook equals good, Jeb equals bad. 
I want to observe Jeb in action out of bounds, so I got in position and started ringing the bell like crazy. Jeb attacked, but it wasn't killing me for some reason. I realized I may have broken Jeb while clearing some properties that allowed us to observe Jeb with no obstructions. So once I realized that, I readjusted and tried again. Slowing this down makes the sequence goofy looking. But as you can see, Jeb doesn't mess around, painting the immediate area with your blood. The player model vanished in the midst of the attack, and then Jeb just goes back to sleep. Um, so much for making that quota. But with that, we've reached the end of Lethal Company's first moon experimentation. There are other moons to explore, so let me know if you want to see more of this. Cheers for now.